good evening and welcome to uh, our next event in the Thinking About series. Um, we're very lucky this afternoon to be able to welcome Dr. Oliver Curry. Um, Dr. Curry is, uh, uh, does his research at the School of Anthropology in Oxford, uh, Oxford University, as well as at the LSE. He is also the director of Kind Lab, information about which can be found at www.kindness.org. Now, the way we're going to organize uh, this afternoon's lecture is uh, I'm about to show uh, a talk that Dr. Curry gave um, for TEDx that lasts about nine or 10 minutes. And then we'll start asking questions. And then once um, I and uh, my two student panelists, um, Sydney and Aiken, um, have asked some questions, got the discussion going, we'll open it up to anyone in the audience who'd like to ask questions. I, may I invite you please to type your questions in using the uh, Q&A. Um, okay, uh, at this point then, I would like to uh, share my screen and show this film. Thank you very much. I, I hope you've uh, seen the argument there. And uh, although there are many questions I could ask, I've already asked some of them of, of Dr. Curry. So at this point, I'd actually like to hand over to our student panelists, Aiken and Sydney, and see if they've got some questions that they would like to ask to get our discussion rolling. So Aiken, off you go. Okay. Um, the first thing I'd like to press you on is uh, you, you said these kind of, there's moral facts. But I, I think from your research, what you've done is you've gone around and you've kind of asked people what they think morality is across lots of different cultures, and you found the common theme tends to be cooperation. But just because someone thinks that's what morality is doesn't necessarily mean that is morality. Just because lots of people hold a common view doesn't mean that that view is right. For example, I would say I disagree with the rule that you should love your family because I don't think that's an absolute sentence, and I can think of lots of situations and lots of bad families where someone is not necessarily obliged to do that. And so how would you kind of respond from moving from that, what people think morality is to that actually being morality? Well, I can see you're gonna be trouble, Aiken, but uh, it's gonna be fun. Um, so, well, so first of all, the um, it's kind of the other way around. So we started out with a, we didn't just go and ask people and sort of add up what they what they said or just sort of sift through all the, the um, the ethnography is what we did was we started out with a theory um, that that morality was all about cooperation and in particular that it would it would be about these specific types of cooperation and then we tested that theory against some data now in this case the data was um, uh, these ethnographic records of these different societies around the world so we were testing to see whether these rules appeared in all these different societies and certainly there were other things that were recorded in these ethnographies that, that weren't part of our theory and so we, should, we, we didn't collect data on. Um, so it, it's more, we have a prior theory, then we test it, the, the theory passes the test and uh, so far so good. And generally speaking, the theory that morality is about cooperation is a, um, it's not the only theory, but it's a, a fairly mainstream, uh, it's a common view in, in ethics, it's a common view in, uh, in contemporary psychology and moral psychology. Um, the only difference being that people tend to think of cooperation as one thing, whereas um, I'm quite keen to point out that there are many different types of cooperation. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a prior theory, it's tested, it's not just sort of doing an, uh, an opinion poll. And in terms of the, the, um, uh, the loving your family thing, um, I hope you... Uh, yeah, of course, um, none of the, the, the argument isn't that all of these rules must be obeyed all the time. Um, in fact, it's, that's almost not possible because give, given that these are independent, these are somewhat independent values, inevitably they're gonna come into conflict um, in some times. Sometimes you won't be able, you'll have to, in a moral dilemma, you have to choose between say, uh, helping your family or helping your group. So sometimes um, some, one of the other principles will take precedence. 
But you said, you said, for example, that you, uh, people shouldn't love their families if their families were bad. True. But then the question is, well, what makes a family bad? And the argument would be, it's because they've broken one of, one of those other rules um, that they, they have, um, that they, they don't love you in return, or they have, they're a, your, uh, your family are all thieves or, or something like that. So yes, these principles can come into conflict, but when you, when you um, zoom out and try and weigh them all up, you're still back at thinking about what's the cooperative thing to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, can, I, can I ask another one? And, and Go ahead, Aiken. The, um, the seven moral rules you've, I, something that I see in common when I uh, see all the kind of evidence you propose is I see that it's actually not about cooperation, but about the benefit that cooperation brings. And I would say, well, that's utilitarianism. And, and a quote from your talk was, where you have to choose between two or more cooperative options, then you should choose the more cooperative move, the one that benefits the most, the one that benefits the most benefits, the greater good. And is the greater good not utilitarianism? Is, is sharing and kind of, we don't want zero sum kind of interactions. We want what's interactions where everyone benefits, but that's because of the benefit itself rather than the cooperation itself. Um, what, what led you to think it was the cooperation? Um, Right. Well, um, I mean, the, obviously, cooperation and benefits are very related. Cooperation is a, um, a, a very powerful way of generating benefits. And the different types of cooperation are different configurations of, of costs and benefits for different in different types of social interaction. So obviously, it comes down to benefit in the end. Um, I think the difference between what, what um, this theory proposes, uh, or what, the, what this theory proposes is that Morality is about maximizing welfare by means of cooperation, by means of co these cooperative strategies, whereas utilitarianism is more um, by any means necessary. So whatever maximizes well-being, whether it's cooperative or not, um, is the right thing to do. And so that's the, that's the way in which they're different. So, so the cooperative view is that what we call morality are these different cooperative strategies. Uh, utilitarianism says you can do it, you, you know, uh, uh, all of the above or anything else. Um, and that's not to, now that's not to say that some some utilitarian strategies are not very valuable and generate lots of benefits. They they do. Um, but they I would say they're not they're not strictly speaking uh, moral. And most of the moral psychology finds that um, the cases where utilitarianism is considered immoral is because it's not going via one of these um, sort of everyday types of cooperation. It's not. It's it's violating some principle of uh, of justice or fairness or loyalty or love to in order to maximise the benefits. So that um, that they are different, and we could talk about the pros and cons, but that's the difference. Thank you. Um, so my questions for you are not as directly. Um, focused on your actual theory and what you've presented the tentor, the more general questions. So my first question is, what initially influenced you to take, um, to start your journey on ethical problem solutions and morality? Uh, well, that's interesting. Well, the, the first time I realized I was interested in uh, morality was that it, my, when I was a, when I was maybe about your age or a bit younger, um, my family bought a game called Scruples, which is a bit like Trivial Pursuit, except it's, it's about moral dilemmas and you have to, everyone gets cards with moral dilemmas and you have to predict what other members of your family are going to do. Um, and there, this was so long ago, one I remember it was so long ago, it was before there were seat belts in cars. And I remember one of the dilemmas was, um, you just bought a new car, you're doing a school run and you just bought a new car, but there's only one seat belt in it. Do you put your kid in the seat belt or your friend's kid? And it was all it was all things like that, like just everyday, everyday little moments that make go, uh, what am I going to do? I remember thinking, wow, this is really, these seem like really important questions and it would be a good idea to get the answer right and figure out how to do this. Um, and so that's what sort of, um, sort of wet my appetite. And then I went, when I went to university, I thought, oh, well, they'll explain it all to me. And then I'll go off and have a normal, happy life and hopefully do the right thing. Um, and the further I got through university, the less satisfied I was with the answers and then decided I had to try and figure out myself, um, which led to my PhD and here we are. 
if that answers and your just, question. Yeah, and just on that point, I know you spoke about dilemmas. What's the most challenging dilemma you've been presented with and you've actually looked into? You, what you mean from a, in a research context or in in life? In life that you've come across and you, yeah, it really made you choose. I don't know. I'm still not sure about the seatbelt dilemma, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, what is the most, I don't know. Um, uh, that's a very that's a very good question which I will I will ponder for a little bit. Um, yeah, I think um, yeah. I mean, most of my work is about um, sort of morality in general, rather than specific um, specific sort of applied ethics. But I hope that further down that you know, and I'm um, I definitely know. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I'm no guru. I don't know um, what, what the right thing to do is in all these cases. Um, I think all I'm trying to do is make the, the process by which people make moral decisions and uh, sort of explicit to get it out in the open in the hope that that makes it easier to see the right answer, whatever, whatever that is. Mm. Esther asks, can morality be genetic if your family was evil or good? Uh, does it determine your morality, which I think links in nicely to what you've said about kin selection and how that kind of draws in? So, well, so the short answer is yes. Um, not so much determine, but but influence. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, people, people, niceness is normally distributed in the same way that height is normally distributed. So there's some very tall people, some very short people, and most people are average. It's the same with with morality. There's some saints and some psychopaths but most of us are do okay most of the time and the reasons why people vary are the same for all these different traits it's a mixture of genetics and, and environment um, so uh, yes the I mean related to how your the, the temperament and personality of your of your parents and related to you know the, the world you grew up in the experiences you have um, and so on can I ask, do genes make you selfish, not just towards yourself because you want to continue your own genes, but also because your, uh, your family shares some of your genes, so you want them to succeed too? And is, is that selfish or is it just natural? Um, well, your genes are natural. They naturally make you selfish and cooperative. Um, so they, so there's, there's good and bad bits of human nature and you know, bi biology expl explains them all. Um, the the notion of selfish genes is, is uh, catches a lot of people out because it's a metaphor. So what Richard Dawkins, who coined the phrase, was saying was is is when you if you want to think about how evolution works, it's useful to take to to pretend that you're a selfish gene, thinking about how to how to make the most copies of yourself down the generations. What what would you do? What kinds of animals would you build? Um, what kinds of behavioral strategies would you um, would you foster? Um, but it it just means, and genes are selfish in the sense that they are self-promoting, they're self-replicating, they get themselves copied, which is good because if they didn't, none, no, none of us would be here. But the point is that they that genes can get themselves copied. There's, there's more than one, to, one way of making a living. Genes can make themselves copied at the expense of other genes in other individuals, or they can get themselves copied in concert with other genes and other individuals so by cooperating with other genes and other individuals and it's the it's all those that rich array of cooperative strategies that generates all of our all pro-social behavior including uh, including ours um, and generates the behavior and the traits and the characteristics that that we call moral Haman asks how much of morality is socially constructed and influenced and how much of it is genetics and evolutionary. Where do you think the kind of, how much of each? Right, well, um, so there's a lot packed into that question. So in terms of, uh, we've recently, uh, I was recently did a study, a twin study, where we, we have a, a moral values questionnaire and we administered this questionnaire to 2000 twins. And what that enables you to do is, um, is tease out the relative effects of genes and environment on, on why people vary. And what we found was that, there, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the, the let's say about 
10% of the differences between people were due to differences in genes. And 0% of uh, differences between people were due to differences in shared environment, which basically means your parents, how, how your parents treat you, which is a surprise. Most of the difference between people was was a question mark, was unknown. So what, what did I say? 10, uh, tens, it's about 10, zero, and then 90% uh, was un, unknown or not genes, not parental environment, but something else. And that could just be, could be random noise or it could be other aspects of the environment. Like I said, like the neighborhood you grew up in or, or what kind of school you went to, um, how your teachers are, what, your, what kind of example your teachers set, um, some, something else. So um, yeah, it, it looks like it's, it's a little bit genes, mostly unknown, prop that, and that's probably the wider environment. Okay, um, okay, Sydney. Oh yeah. uh, so Mary asks, lots of social, me social morals are not constant and change over time, like respecting women, black people, queer people. What brings about a change in a set of social morals? And are previous societies immoral because they didn't follow our current beliefs? If so, surely our society will soon be deemed immoral because our current set of moral morals will change e.g. in the future, we could respect animals or robots? Um, yes. So, um, a, a fantastic question. Um, if, oh, it's just disappeared off my screen. Um, a fantastic question. Um, and the short answer is, uh, I, don't, I don't know um, specifically. In general, what the theory would say is that uh, the theory doesn't ex the theory doesn't expect morals to stay the same to be identical you know in all times and places what the theory would say is that our moral values reflect the value of different types of cooperation under different conditions so um uh, uh, my guess is that let's just take um something like the the change in status of of um of women in society i think that's what what has happened over the and um, this is an example. Um, what has happened over the last century or so is that social and economic conditions have changed such that it's now um, uh, women are able to make, uh, women go to work now in a way they didn't before. They're able to make a contribution in the wider world in the way that they weren't able to before. And, we, and they are now more powerful. And so they, they have money, they have spending power. They, um, they can, uh, they're legally allowed to make more decisions. Um, and and with that has come more respect and more treating more people more like equals. So what's happened is there's a change in the way that humans make a living, um, and that's had knock-on consequences for the kinds of cooperation and social relationships that are um, possible. And people have updated their their moral values um, as a as a consequence. Um, and certainly, uh, in terms in the oh the other thing to say is. Um, it's in terms of judging uh, d different cultures, other cultures. Um, it's certainly the case that 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 some practices can be. Uh, it's certainly the case that some practices can be can be wrong, and individuals and societies can can do the wrong thing and make mistakes and um, and be immoral. But I think that in order to make a more informed judgment of different people in different places, uh, in the in the including in the past. You have to really. Um, you, you should first put yourself in their shoes and think about well, what were the, what were the options available to them at the time, um, and uh, did so. The question, like did like I said, did did they make the cooperative move? Um, you might have what opportunities to, to to cooperate and do moral things that people in different times and places might not um, have had the opportunity to. Uh, now they could still make the wrong choice in those in that context, but it, I think it's important to sort of see the world as uh, as they did. Um, thank you. Tess also asks, how would the discovery of a morality pill or a, mor a moral enhancing drug impact how people should use these cooperative strategies? Yeah, very good. Um, a morality pill. Um, so let me, so first of all, in principle, it, it would be certainly possible if we had the technology, it would certainly be possible to have some chemical or technological um, uh, intervention that would change how people 
change the decisions people made, change the moral decisions people made, up or down regulate some of their um, moral dials, as it were. Um, so in principle, that's possible. And in fact, there's, some, there's a really interesting study uh, on using, I'm going to TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where this is a bit of a sideshow, but um, when you, sometimes when you make a moral decision, you, you're interested in whether the person did, it on, did something on purpose or not. And the little bit of software that enables you to determine what someone was thinking uh, is, I'm, I'm simplifying, but is sort of here. And it's possible if you put a very strong magnet here, you can switch that bit of your brain off. And then all of a sudden you don't factor that into your moral decisions anymore. Um, so I think I want to say that's if you Google um, Rebecca Sachs on moral decisions, I think S-A-X-E, you can see her doing that. Anyway, so there's an example where it's a kind of a moral wand where you can put it on someone's head and it changes the decisions they make. Um, so in principle, you could certainly change things. Um, whether you should or not, um, it depends on, it depends on what I would say whether people are uh, sort of optimal, optimally cooperating at the moment. So it's easy to think of, oh, mor morality is good, so let's have more of it. But it is possible to have too much of a good thing. It is possible to give too much away. It is possible to be exploited. Um, it is possible to be taken advantage of. And so some people, certainly some people, you know, if the goal is stable cooperation, some people could do with upregulating their cooperation. Some people could do with calming down a bit. Uh, so um, exactly, you know, what if you want to turn it up or down would depend on um, depend on the person, depend on their starting point. Off that, how much does morality link to poverty? Asks Cassidy. Does that? Um, do you mean are rich or poor people more or less moral? Is that is that what that means? I, I don't know, but I, I I imagine partly and partly if. if a large part of the population is poor, does it mean they can cooperate less? Or, or do they... Um, so, yeah, it's a good question. I, um, As far as I remember, the evidence is a bit mixed. So there there was a study out a few... So these are you're all asking cutting-edge questions and they're so good, I don't know the answers. Um, so there was a study a few years ago that suggested rich the richer you are, the, as it were, the more selfish you are, the less likely you are to give money to charity. And, if, and everyone went, ooh, those, those naughty rich people. And then there was another study a couple of years after that that sort of came to the opposite conclusion. No, actually, um, rich people give more to charity or give them a larger percentage of their income to charity. And to, be, and to be honest, I can't remember. So the evidence goes both ways. I can't remember if there's been an update or any attempt to consolidate them. Um, uh, and, and so I'm not sure of the answer. And intuitively, I think it could possibly go both ways. It could be that um, the more, the, as it were, the poorer you are, the more you need to cooperate. Um, or it could be that the poorer you are, the uh, you can't risk cooperating. So you have to be more selfish and vice versa with rich, with, uh, rich people. But it, I think it's an open empirical question and I'm not sure of the answer. Do you think uh, morality and the promotion of moral values is currently on the decline? Asks Katie. Um, do I think it's on the decline? Um, I, again, I don't know. I don't know of any, I'm trying to think of some measure of how much people are taught to be moral. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's on the, on the increase or or not um uh so yeah i don't i don't know i'm trying to think what how would you measure how much morality is taught i'm not sure uh, so i don't know another good question what i mean one related question is uh re like uh religious teachings of morality and there's a widespread view that uh if religion is taken less seriously and um, religions aren't, uh, you're not listening to your priest as much and you're not doing as you're told by uh, religious authorities, then 
where are you going to get your morals from? You, you know, society is going to collapse. Um, again, the, the evidence on that is very mixed. There doesn't seem to be a strong uh, relationship between religion and morality and within countries. And across countries, the opposite seems to be the case, that um, countries with more atheists are, have, fewer, have less crime and are generally safer and have lower murder rates and, and everything else. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's all I've got to say on that one. Zakai asks, how, do you, how does your ideas or morality stand up to immoral acts made by people out of control, specifically due to having, for example, a mental illness or some other factor, something you cannot control? Are they responsible? And if not, how can justice be found for the victim? Yes, okay, so I think... Um, you know, the whole question of free will and moral responsibility is a very, is a philosopher's favorite because it's very slippery and confusing. I think that when people are asking about moral responsibility, what, uh, what they're really asking is, um, where could I intervene to change this? Um, so if the person, if the person of sound mind has chosen to do a bad thing, then the, the, place to inter the place to intervene is here. So you apply pressure here, you punish this person um, you do something to me, you lock me up or you find me or whatever. Um, if, however, the decision, if I'm, if I'm uh, sick, if I'm, de if I'm, have, if I'm deranged, if I'm someone's, someone else has uh, slipped me some mind altering drug and I go off and do something, then where, where do you intervene? Well, you intervene, the place to intervene is at the person who caused the um, caused me to take this drug, or you intervene to to cure the disease um, if that's if that's possible. So um, I don't, it doesn't seem there's no place for free will in science in general, but I don't think you need it in order to hold people responsible for their actions and more specifically to find the place where you need to intervene to change things. Abigail asks. Can global morality be expected to change with the rise of technology use? What do you think? Does can global morality? Um, How are you what? using te uh, technology with your kind of promotion of morality? Mm -hmm. um, what I was going to say was, uh, again, these are all these are all great questions which I, I I haven't worked on directly, so I can't. I'm just I'm giving you my best guess. Um, there's a there's some very interesting, I've read some very interesting ideas about um, that along the lines of that we're currently in the, the wild west of the internet, um, of uh, social media and everything else. Um, or, or another analogy, and, and so things have yet to calm down. We have, we, we've, we're in this new world where there's no rules and people are trying things out and making mistakes and there's some good things and some bad things. And just like in the wild west, eventually what will happen is we'll settle on some some norms, some rules that calm everything down a bit and hopefully do the best they can to, uh, to you know, maximize the positive and minimize the negative. Or another analogy is um, when, when people first moved into cities. So once upon a time, you know, we were, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers, we, we roamed around, uh, we moved around a lot in relatively small groups. With the advent of, when, we, when humans started living in cities, let's say, five, 10,000 years ago, all of a sudden there were a lot more people closer together, not moving. And to begin with, it was a nightmare. Uh, people got, people got um, sick, they were infecting one another, they had their animals roaming around, messing the place up. Um, although cities had many things going for them, in terms of disease and life expectancy, it was a complete catastrophe until people figured out what was going on and how sort of figured out how to be urban how to live in a in a city and then um you know civilization as we know it took off uh, so we might be seeing something very similar now with with um, the internet and social media in that the whole world's figuring out how to live together in this new space and uh, i'm optimistic that we'll uh, alight on some uh, some some good cooperative rules sophie asks were there any experiences you had from studying the different countries that have really stuck with you? Um, 
Yeah, so the main, the main experience, to be honest, was it was reading through all this stuff. Um, and I remember when the first time I did, I asked my research assistant just to, I had no idea how much material there was. And I asked my research assistant to, if she could just print it out and I was going to read it over the weekend. And I remember she's kind of, she turned up in my office with like a wheelbarrow with sort of eight feet of, uh, of paper, like breeze blocks worth of paper um, printed out. So anyway, um, so I certainly, what was the most surprising thing about reading all the material was that there was nothing surprising. Um, I genuinely thought that, sure, we're going to find examples of, of bravery and reciprocity and love thy neighbor and all that. But I also thought, oh, there's also going to be some really, uh, really inexplicable, bizarre moral rules in here that are going to, they'll be really interesting and will really challenge the theory. And then I'll have to go and think about, does this falsify the theory or can we develop it in a way that captures it? You know, I was thinking that, you know, oh, in this society, it was, it was immoral to stand on one leg for more than 10 minutes. Or in this society, everyone, I don't know, everyone had to turn, everyone had to um, slap their aunts in the face every fourth Tuesday or whatever it was going to be. So I thought there were going to be loads of really strange rules. And to my surprise, there was, there was nothing like that at all in all these, you know, you know, it was in over half a million words of descriptions of different ethics. Um, there was, I can honestly say there was nothing in there that would strike anyone as particularly, any of you as particularly strange or bizarre. Um, certainly some of the priorities were different. So often, People, uh, people in traditional societies might favour their their families and their groups and their chi and their chiefs over rather than be be fair or treat people equally. Um, so I think in many cases the the, um, the the priorities were different, the rankings were different, but the basic principles were not unfamiliar. I think they would be um, easily recognisable. Well, I take my word for it; they were um, relatively straightforward. Um, I'm trying to think of other other things that struck me. I, I mean, other things. Um, the, the, there's one. One. There's a few sort of anecdotes that come to mind. One. One that sticks in my mind was, um, as, partly as an illustration of what I said before. There was one um, story of somewhere in Africa, and I can't. I forget the place exactly. But anyway, the story was. The anthropologists were saying in this particular society, they um, they don't value telling the truth, like uh, as you might expect. Um, there's not such a high priority on telling the truth. And he gave an example of there was a there was a girl who was accused of a policeman came up to her and accused her of committing a particularly serious crime, and she she confessed. She said yes, that was yes, I did it, um, and she was arrested and blah blah blah. Went all the way through to court. Um, and it turned out in the course of the trial that it became apparent that she couldn't possibly have done this crime. She was in a completely different place. She obviously wasn't, she hadn't done it at all. And her, her confession was false. And the, the narrator was saying, and this, this looked like an example of these people not um, think they didn't think it was important to tell the truth. Um, but it turned out that what, what actually happened was they did, they did want to tell the truth, but an even more important value was, was not disrespecting people in authority. So when the policeman came to her and said, you've done this, uh, you've done this crime, haven't you? Her first reaction was, well, I don't want to contradict this policeman. I don't, I don't want to humiliate him or say he's wrong. So I'll just say, yes, if you say so. And, and, off, and then the whole rest of the saga um, played out. So again, I suspect that we probably wouldn't do that. We would probably tell the truth. But the, the notion, the idea of not wanting to contradict someone in authority, I think um, even if we wouldn't do it, we understand the principle. Aman asks, would you say that humans have a moral code built into them that is somewhat universal? And also, would you say that if there yes. is a code, we can turn morality into a kind of mathematical science and know what right and wrong is almost objectively? Yes, that was an easy one. Yes and yes. Um, so I want to, so so yes I think that we have um, we have an inbuilt moral psychology just like we have an inbuilt visual system and an inbuilt motor cortex. Um, I mean I want to emphasize again that it's it's not saying that everyone's moral values will be identical. I think of it like a, a graphic equalizer and 
how important those different principles are um, can vary for, for predictable reasons between people, between individuals um, and between societies. Um, but yeah, I think, we, I think we come, something I was gonna say to one of the earlier questions, um, Aldous Huxley has a great quote and he, you know, he says, um, he has many great quotes, but one of his quotes is, uh, the, the, ends are, the ends are ape chosen, only the means are man's. So what he's saying is that our basic motivations are ancient and it, how we achieve those ends um, is, is uh, sometimes more human, more artificial. We, we invent ways of achieving our goals, but the basic goals are fairly ancient. So yeah, I think we have, um, a, we, have we, come, uh, we have some inbuilt moral software, um, but it, it, uh, it, it's designed to vary according to the environment we find ourselves. And yes, in principle, if we could, the more we understand about that software, the more able we will be to, for example, progr program it into a robot to make a recognizably moral uh, robot. Lewis asks, is it moral to do something even if you don't agree with how other people act on it? Like for example, paying your taxes, even if you don't agree with how the government spends it, why or why not? Um, is it, well, um, so I think like life is all about trade-offs and these different, like I said, these different principles often come into conflict. And so if you, so you could certainly find yourself in a position where, okay, as it were, deferring to authority involves paying taxes. But I think that the taxes, are, that when the government gets this money, they're going to do something uncooperative. They're going to, um, they're going to launch a war. They're going to prosecute um, a crime that I don't think, uh, they're going to enforce a law, which I don't think is a moral law. So in those situations, you have to make a decision, not just for the sort of what are the costs for, for you of breaking the law, but as in what is the right thing to do? Is it more important to, and obviously you can't, we can't live in a world where everyone's deciding for themselves which laws to be enforced, that you have to take the rough with the smooth and it's always gonna be a compromise. Um, but yeah, there, I, there, will be, there will be situations where doing as you're told contradicts with some other principle and you'll have to make a trade-off um, between them. And sometimes, um, uh, you know, sometimes you will decide to be civilly disobedient, to disobey the law, to sit in, to, you know, go on a protest, to stage a sit-in, and that will be the right thing to do, even if it breaks the law. Aman, uh, oh, sorry, Asha asks, do you think it possible for a society's moral values to change quickly, or does this change only occur over a long period of time? Um, uh, that's a good question. I would, so all of you people asking all these questions, um, please, uh, you know, I need all the research assistance I can get. So um, let's, let's have some of you guys <laughs> look into some of these issues. Uh, can it, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I, I don't have any, I think it could be either and both. Um, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm th the, only, the sort of the most recent example I can think of that people people have been talking about recently is the the change in attitude, for example, to gay marriage, at least in the uh, in in America, where it's a bit more on display. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you had mainstream politicians, including Barack Obama, saying, "I'm not in favor of gay marriage," and then within a decade, it completely switched, and now. To, to hold the position that Barack Obama held a decade ago would now be, you'd be canceled for having that exact same position. So there's an example where it's switched um, dramatically. Um, yeah, I'm trying, to I'm trying to think of a, you've prompted me to think of the following answer that I've just made up. I think that, I, I think it's useful to think about morality as an, as, a, as an attempt, as an attempt to cooperate. It's a theory of how to cooperate, a theory of how to realize these mutual benefits. And theories, uh, theories sometimes they change slowly, but theories can also change very quickly. You know, if you get, if a theory is conclusively refuted, if you, if you test something and it doesn't work, 
your theory can dramatically switch to, to a new theory. Um, so I don't know, perhaps it's similar in that morality is also similar in that way in that you can, you can have a theory about how to act um, that, that has worked so far and so you don't want to change it. Um, and then a bit like Wiley e. Coyote uh, going off the cliff, that might be an, an old reference, a bit like Wiley e. Coyote going off the cliff, all of a sudden the ground shifts from under you and you, you keep trying to do the same thing and then suddenly you realize it doesn't work anymore or it's not the, it's not the most it's not the optimal thing to do and you can switch to a different um, a different rule a different a different law Eve good question uh, oh sorry to cut you off Eve asks do you think morality is dependent on a guilt or shame culture well both um, it looks like uh, these are very good questions. Um, it looks like um, guilt is what happens if you fail to reciprocate. So um, you do me a favor and then I'm unable to do you a favor and I feel guilty about it. And it motivates me to make amends further down the line. Whereas shame seems to be related to a, um, a lack of heroic traits or, or, or more broadly having low value having traits that are, are of low social value so i've done some work on this with a a colleague of mine called daniel sneezer and you should uh look look at daniel Sne uh s z n y c e r and he's shown in some great cross-cultural work that as basically people are proud of traits that others value so if you are um, if you are if you are strong, if you are attractive, if you are a good hunter, if you are if you're good at telling stories, if you are a good cook, blah blah blah, you are these are traits that you are proud of, and your pride correlates with how much other people value them. Um, whereas if you lack those traits, if you are um, if you are not all those things, if if you are bad, if you do not have those skills such that people do not value you, you feel ashamed of those traits. You try to conceal them. You, you obviously don't advertise them, you deny them if, the, if people ask. So, um, and so that applies to the sort of hawkish heroism dimension on the, of the seven things I was talking about. So I think that all of those, so guilt and shame are present in all, all cultures, um, but I, it looks like cultures vary on the relative importance of them. And certainly it looks like in traditional societies where your place in the, in the pecking order was much more important and much more stable uh, sh those tend to be shame cultures where if you go down a peg or two you feel bad about it whereas in modern societies where it's much more mobile it's much your not everybody knows your business all the time um wh while we still have shame and we still have things we are ashamed of it's it it doesn't play as big a role our, our final question from Cassidy, sorry to everyone we didn't get I'm to. Just, I'm just getting warmed up. Oh, I know. Um, what doesn't morality lead us to, why, oh, why doesn't morality lead us to solve the climate change problem? Or what does your research tell us about how we can take action on climate change? Good. Just end, just end with an easy one, why don't you? Um, well, this okay. So, lot, I think lots of reasons. Um, one is that, um, well, so a standard analysis of this is that cl climate change is a tragedy of the commons, which is that everyone would benefit if if everyone pitched in. So, so I would benefit we, we, if we all did the right thing, if we all recycled or stopped flying or whatever, whatever the proposal is. But I would benefit even more if you guys stopped flying and recycled your stuff and I didn't and I carried on doing whatever I want. So then I get the benefits of all of you pitching in and I don't pay any of the costs. So I come out ahead. Um, and if everybody realizes that, if everybody um, thinks that it, this is great if everyone else does it, then, then no one will do it. Um, if everyone's waiting for everyone else to pick up the bill, no, no one will make take the first step and then we'll all end up worse off. 
So that's the, that's the standard um, uh, analysis. And the, so there's a few solutions to that. One is um, you have to, uh, let's think, you have to, you have to, uh, well, either you force people to do the right thing through, through taxes and um, punishments and fines and things, um, but more generally, you have to, no one wants to be the sucker. No one wants to be the only one paying the cost while everyone, uh, everyone else takes the benefit. So you have to sort of reassure people that we're, that we're all in this together and you have to make other people's, people's contribution visible. Um, and if you, can, if you can do that, if you can uh, reassure, uh, I this, if you can get everyone to act in concert, get everyone to act together and, you, and everyone can see that everyone's doing their best, um, then that's how to. That's one way to overcome it. We also have a paper called. Um, uh, it's called cooperative conservation, which answers this question in a bit more detail. And the gist of that paper is, although the tragedy of the commons analysis is is correct, it's uh, like I say, it's not the only problem, and we might have more success promoting environmental green policies if we try to solve some of the other problems too. So we appeal. Not just to pe not just to people's guilt um, for not doing the right thing, but we also appeal to their um, the love of their fam to how much they love their families and how much they want their grandkids grandkids to enjoy. Uh, we we appeal to their family values. We appeal to their the loyalty and pride in a particular place or in a particular country. Um, we appeal to their sense of fairness about how they're taking. There's a um, there's a, a whole campaign called Nature Needs Half. And the just that's appealing to our sense of fairness, saying, "Come on, we've taken more than our fair share. That all the other animals need some stuff too." So um, we, although the tragedy of the commons is a common analysis, we could appeal to the whole range of people's moral intuitions to try to get them to do the right thing. Um, we've come to the end of our event. We just want to say a massive thanks to everyone that attended and asked questions. We do apologise if we never got to your questions. There were many questions that. We I'm pretty sure that Dr. Curry was happy to answer all of them. We'd like to give a massive thanks for Dr. Curry for spending your evening with us. We'd also give, like to give a massive thanks to Dr. Crowley. Um, and yeah, thank you guys all again for being here. Thank you for your you. questions. Um, there's, a, there's a talk the week after half term on thinking about sustainable finance. So if you enjoyed this talk and if you're interested in sustainable finance, do come along to that. That's on the 23rd of February at 5pm.